Sassy's adoption has exploded over the last few years, but what if moving to the cloud isn't an option? As organizations increasingly migrate from on-premise environments to cloud first and work from anywhere, the need for a security framework like SASE becomes more apparent. By offloading security to the cloud instead of the premise, SASE allows organizations to apply cloud-based security closer to where their applications and services are located. The challenge is, for many organizations, sending all your traffic to the cloud is not ideal. In fact, there are entire industries where sending traffic to a third-party cloud is not allowed. Think about healthcare or finance, where compliance and data sovereignty rules dictate exactly where data can reside, or government agencies that handle sensitive workloads and cannot rely on commercial cloud infrastructure. And even when cloud is an option, it may not always be preferred, particularly for organizations with many applications and services in-house. This is why a new type of SASE model called Sovereign SASE has emerged to give organizations a new way to deploy SASE completely within their private infrastructure and avoiding the cloud altogether. In this video, we're going to break down what Sovereign SASE is and how its architecture is designed around data sovereignty principles and privacy. Let's start by first defining what exactly Sovereign SASE is. To level set, when we talk about Sovereign SASE, we're referring to the deployment of SASE capabilities entirely within an organization's private infrastructure, with the primary goal of keeping user traffic, data, and logs completely within the network premise and off the vendor's cloud. Unlike traditional SASE offerings, where users connect to vendor POPs for security inspection and policy enforcement, with Sovereign SASE, all security inspection locations are hosted within the organizational infrastructure. To understand how Sovereign SASE works, it's important to discuss the major pillars from which Sovereign SASE is designed. The first foundational pillar is data sovereignty, the principle that user data must remain within clearly defined boundaries and under the organization's full control. This includes the ability to enforce data jurisdiction, meaning organizations should be able to specify exactly where the data resides and ensure that it never leaves a geographical or regulatory boundary. In relation to Sovereign SASE, this is a foundational element that means user data must never be stored or processed outside the boundaries defined by the organization. Any SASE solution that stores data outside those boundaries or outside the organization's direct control cannot be considered a true Sovereign SASE deployment. The second pillar in the Sovereign SASE framework is that all data plane processing and user data is completely within the organization's infrastructure or boundary. Unlike traditional SASE models where security inspection is happening in the vendor cloud, in Sovereign SASE, the inspection and policy enforcement is happening within private POP locations. This could be an organization's own data center or co-location, or even rented hardware. But the key point is the organization controls who has access to the infrastructure and exactly where data resides. The third pillar of the Sovereign SASE model is service autonomy the principle that organizations should maintain granular control over the security services they deliver to their users with minimal reliance on external or third-party dependencies. This means having control over things like physical architecture, being able to select the level of redundancy that is suitable for their use case. For example, if a device fails, should traffic stay in a data center or fail over to the next available POP location? Granular control and flexibility also applies to the SASE services the organization chooses to utilize. For example, some organizations may decide that SSL VPN is outdated and IPsec should be used for all user connections. These are choices that an organization may be able to make and Sovereign SASE should be able to provide the flexibility to allow them to choose accordingly. Let's now see how this all comes together by reviewing what the architecture in a Sovereign SASE model looks like in the real world. The Sovereign SASE architecture is made up of three major sections, the user layer, the data plane layer, and the control plane layer. Because SASE encompasses a broad range of security and network functions, including endpoint protection, next-gen firewall, load balancing, and of course more, a clear separation between control plane and data plane is essential. The control plane is responsible for orchestration and management typically accessed through a web-based portal where administrators define security rules and policies. These configurations are then synchronized downstream to the data plane and user layer, which enforces those policies in real time. In a sovereign SASE model, the data plane is hosted entirely within the organization's network infrastructure. It is responsible for all security inspection and network connectivity functions and remains strictly confined within the organizational boundaries, never offloaded to the cloud. 
This aligns directly with the data sovereignty principles that we just reviewed. The kind of devices at this layer vary by vendor, but it should consist of security devices such as next-gen firewalls that are capable of handling the security services that a SASE solution would require, such as secure web gateway and ZTNA enforcement. Rules and policies configured in the control plane are pushed down to devices at this layer, where they are enforced in real time. This layer is ultimately where users connect to when accessing SASE services, ensuring that all traffic remains again within those organizational boundaries that have been set. At the user layer, the experience should feel identical to that of a traditional SASE deployment. The key distinction is that users are connecting to private security POPs within the organizational infrastructure instead of cloud-hosted POPs at the vendor's data center. At this layer, Endpoint clients play a critical role by communicating with the controller to enable three core functions, the first of which is endpoint policies. These are typical endpoint protection features that an admin has configured through the web portal and pushed down to that specific user or user group. The second is network connectivity. The orchestrator from the control plane tells the endpoints where to connect to for the nearest POP location, as well as ZTNA destinations that they can access directly for applications and services. Lastly, the orchestrator is doing consistent security posture checking to ensure that endpoints remain compliant and then makes updates accordingly. Together, these three layers form the foundation of the Sovereign SASE architecture, each aligned with the core principles we just reviewed and a primary focus on upholding data sovereignty by keeping user traffic, inspection, and logging entirely within the organization's control. An important note is that Sovereign SASE is not a SASE service in and of itself. Rather, it's a platform that includes everything you need, both hardware and software, to deliver a private SASE service for your users. It's less of a technology or service and more of a platform that accelerates and simplifies your journey towards a private SASE solution. That said, a Sovereign SASE solution offers several benefits, including a comprehensive technology stack. This should include all essential components, such as the endpoint software needed for your users, a next generation firewall for security inspection, and any other core SASE functionality features that a technology would enable. The second benefit is that it acts as a technology integrator, meaning that it unifies various different types of security devices and acts as a unified technology framework, translating intent-based policies across multiple devices that may contain security and network functionality. Third, a centralized orchestration platform. This streamlines policy management and coordinates across different types of systems, such as your endpoint software and your next-gen firewall. Another key benefit is a unified management interface. This should provide a single pane of glass for configuring, monitoring, and visibility across the entire technology stack. Well, that wraps up another video, you guys, but I hope you found it informative. If you received any value at all, my only ask is you take a moment to hit like down below to give me a boost in the YouTube algorithm, which will help others see this video and content like this. That being said, if you haven't subscribed, please take a moment to subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this and stay on top of our latest releases.